in terms of TikTok and those other social media platforms, this might be controversial, but I do feel like they're a bit of a fad. If they're not leading to direct sales, then it's about brand awareness. I see so many companies trying to quantify the ROI on that. But at the end of the day, it is a bit intangible, the value you find there. And obviously it comes with its fair share of controversies all around. You're listening to Retail Remix, your inside access to candid conversations with the people shaping retail's future. Here's your host, Alicia Esposito. If you've listened to the show in the past, you know I love speaking with marketers and content creators. After all, content is something I do every day. And I know firsthand that there are so many new opportunities for us to connect with our audience through content, but there are also a good number of challenges as well. I wanted to dig deep into what those challenges are, how brands can navigate, And most of all, how marketing and content teams can respond to new pressures to perform. What better person to sit down with than Eileen Richardson, who's the founder and CEO of Imaginary Content. She works closely with brands, largely CPG brands, on their content strategy and has a unique expertise in the growing and evolving marketplace space. But make no mistake, we talk about everything involving content strategy, from messaging to branding to, of course, measurement. Listen in because we go in many different directions and we, of course, offer some great tips and best practices along the way. Eileen, thanks so much for being on the show. Very excited to talk all things content with you today. Thank you. I'm excited to be here. Yeah. And honestly, I'm so thrilled to have you on because anytime I can really dig into all things content and content marketing and just truly geek out on it, I get excited. So (laughs) let's dig in on some of the big things that we're tracking, what we're seeing in our day-to-day work. Obviously, it's a very exciting time for content creators today. There are so many new platforms and basically new ways for us to tell stories, right? Like that's the big opportunity. That's the potential. But it's also a very competitive and challenging time for content creators too. I'm curious, I mean, how do you kind of see and reconcile the current landscape? Is this kind of like a glass half empty thing, half full? I feel like this will set the stage for our conversation. Yeah, good question. And I feel like as you were asking it, I'm recalling that I was making content before we were calling it making content, right? It was just like telling stories and creating visuals. And now it's a whole industry around content creation specifically. And I think with the advent of iPhones and technology, the barrier to entry really dropped for a lot of creative people. And there was that flooding of content everywhere, social feeds and user-generated content. And it was kind of an onslaught of, wow, everybody can make content all the time. But now I feel like industry-wide, everyone's taking a bit of a step back and understanding that from a brand perspective, quality still matters, your tonality matters, your visual messaging matters, and how do you still ensure scale and relevance while taking advantage of all these new platforms and technologies that really reduce the barrier to entry. Yeah. I'm hearing a lot of the same things, right? Because it's like for a while, it was all about the speed and the frequency of the content you're putting out into the world, right? Because that would increase likelihood that you would get found or that, you know, people would discover your account or your content to, of course, engage and reshare with that content. But obviously, there are some algorithm shifts, some changes that are happening within platforms and even through Google, right, that are reprioritizing the relevance, the trustworthiness, the quality, among other things, right? Right. You can get down a whole (laughs) rabbit hole there. But I mean, is that tug of war of quantity versus quality or speed versus scale, like, is that kind of like the big trend that's having the most significant impact on creators today? Or is it more like the tactical or consumption shifts that we're seeing? Like, I know a lot of folks are talking about the shift to 
video and more authentic conversational content? Like, what are you hearing from your client base? What are you seeing as a content creator as being the biggest trends right now? Well, we actually last month moved into our new headquarters and space and we opened our content studio in-house because the demand for content from our clients is as big as ever. But in terms of trends, it, I kind of take a step back when I think about that question. I'm looking at it from the brand perspective of addressing the omni-channel shopper. So previously content creation might have meant doing a broadcast spot for the Super Bowl or some other big attention getting thing to promote your brand in that format. But now you really need to think about all these digital platforms and where your consumer is and how they're engaging with the content. And that is what really impacts what level of content gets created for you. If you're following that, you know, it's not so much like, let's just go make content and throw it all up there anymore. It's like, okay, how do we measure content effectiveness? Where are we putting this content that's speaking to our consumer? How do we know that they're engaging with it? And how do we know that we're actually delivering to them what they're looking for from us? So it's really evolved as sort of most things do from this big free market of there's lots of content everywhere to like a very business-like approach to it, a very considered approach to make sure that there's some measurable ROI, that there's consistent branding, as I mentioned earlier, and that we're being a little more thoughtful in our approach to make sure, A, we're not going off track with brand messaging and, you know, we're not putting content in the hands of influencers that might not be appropriate for us and that we're still managing things from a brand perspective. But we are able to create content at scale in a way that responds to things that are happening culturally and are timely in that way. So it's always a bit of a juggle, <laughs> you mm -hmm. know, in terms of how best to approach it with all these different factors, but the technology has opened it up to not being a question of so much like do we afford it? You know, if we think about like a helicopter shot it used to be such a big deal, you had to get permits and it was so expensive to get that top aerial, beautiful shot. Um, so much planning had to go into it. And now you just like throw up a drone and you've got something you can use. So the barrier to the creation has dropped, but understanding where you should be focusing your time and energy in a way that provides value for your brand or your audience is what the new challenge is. Yeah, 100%. I feel those challenges hard. And it's so funny because, oh my gosh, I've been in the quote unquote content marketing world for about 12 years now. And for a while, there was discussion of like, oh, there are so many new methods, your buyer's preferences and expectations are always changing. So like, Sometimes it's like throwing spaghetti at the wall, right? Like sometimes it sticks, sometimes it doesn't. But to your point, you know, I think taking that more measured approach is definitely more top of mind, which I know we're going to get into later. So I don't want to go there just okay. yet because I, <laughs> I think it's important to talk about this other conversation I, I've been hearing a lot recently, which is the balance of brand versus demand. And I've been asking a few marketing and content leaders about this, even on the show, because it's very interesting to hear the nuances in their responses and how they think about balancing brand marketing and the performance marketing side. Because like in retail, for instance, like D2C brands, everything was like growth marketing, performance marketing, results at all costs, like push to grow, push to grow. And then others are now saying, well, hey, listen, if you don't have a really sound brand, brand strategy, brand marketing strategy, it's like building the house without a sound foundation, right? So I'm curious about your thoughts on like how the two should be balanced. Do they need to work together holistically or like should companies focus on one or the other first? Does that make sense? Like, I feel like it's kind of a chicken or the egg type thing. <laughs> no, no, it totally makes sense. And I agree with the latter part of your point, which is that you need to understand your brand before you can have any effective marketing, content marketing or otherwise. You need to understand what your value proposition is, who your audience is and where they are so you can figure out how to get to them. So I think we see that a lot in social, right? Like people, brands a lot know that they need or they're told they should have some social presence, but 
if you really look at it, what's the value there sometimes? Is it just getting up in the algorithm? Is it really enhancing their brand and leading towards more sales? Or what's the strategy there? And you can always cite those one or two off brands that started as a social idea. I think at Sub Summit yesterday, somebody was talking about how they mine a Reddit feed for ideas. Oh, interesting. They'll see people talking about XYZ and then they'll go make that product of XYZ. And so that's kind of like a reverse configuration. That's the exception, not the rule in terms of going to the digital world and then building your brand af- as an afterthought from that. Most established brands really need to understand who they are and where their customer is. And at the end of the day, it does come down to targeting your customer where they are, whatever platform they're on, whatever way they engage with your brand is where you need to target them. And you need to target them with consistent visual messaging and a visual style that ladders back to your packaging and your brand equity. So everything needs to work together in tandem. We're seeing a lot more of what they're calling the omni-channel shopper approach, right? It's not just digital marketing or content marketing is in a silo from paid media and other marketing. It all has to work together and be part of a cohesive plan to be effective. Yeah, for sure. Especially because we're seeing and hearing a lot about how brands are bringing digital into the store and the opportunity for retail media in particular. And it's like, well, you need content to power all of that, right? So I agree that that Omni approach is definitely key. So you did mention algorithms and platforms. I'm curious, you know, what channels and platforms are kind of rising to the top right now in your strategic conversations with clients, project briefs, like everybody's been talking about TikTok. Now it's like, oh, well, what's going to happen to TikTok? I mean, I feel like there's always this rotating door of buzzy platforms. So is it still TikTok? Is it something else? I mean, what are you hearing from the market right now? Well, you know, a lot of our work in the digital marketplace is focused on CPG, consumer products. And we're really looking at what's happening with the Amazons, the Walmarts, trying to work within those algorithms because that's where the consumers are purchasing our clients' products. So we're looking at how Google is shifting to have their algorithm feature Amazon brand stores instead of something else. We're constantly seeing how those algorithms are changing and evolving and how that ladders back to organic growth opportunities for us. In terms of TikTok and those other social media platforms, this might be controversial, but I do feel like they're a bit of a fad. If they're not leading to direct sales, then it's about brand awareness. I see so many companies trying to quantify the ROI on that, but at the end of the day, it is a bit intangible, the value you find there. And obviously it comes with its fair share of controversies all around. So our clients really focus on how their products show up in the digital marketplace and those platforms and how they're changing and how we can work those algorithms with content to fuel more organic growth. I love that. And I'm noticing too, like across all of the different marketplaces, they're all taking very different approaches to their content offerings, their advertising offerings, like there are some overlaps, of course, but it's been interesting to see how these different retailers or marketplace platforms are trying to offer these new vehicles for storytelling. So it feels a bit richer, right? Because, you know, sometimes I see some product listings on some of these marketplaces and it's it's jarring, right? Because it just seems very stale. It's very technical and it kind of makes the brand miss out on an opportunity, right? So it's just interesting to see that evolution happen. I mean, we've been at the forefront of that by happenstance actually, but <laughs> but it's worked out very well. You know, we've been working in the digital marketplace for Kraft, Heinz and other major brands, figuring out how to make content on their product description pages for all those marketplace retailers that really resonates and drives conversion. And it's still amazing to me, the number of brands that are out there that think of this as an afterthought, when really this 
is where your content drives revenue. By simple tweaks to how you approach your content on those platforms, you can see revenue increases 20, 30%. That ROI on investment is a little easier to track. And we know that video does well. We know that certain kinds of video do well. And at the end of the day, it's about making sure that consumers have what they're looking for to make a purchase they're confident about. And that delivers what they're expecting it to deliver. And that evolves into in some ways, trying to mimic the in-store experience where they're looking at a label or they're comparison shopping. We want to make sure we're giving them content that delivers on what they're looking for so that on their path to purchase, you know, it's a simple click. And I feel like we've been talking about measurement indirectly already over the course of our conversation. So I'm just going to dive right into that topic because I think it's very much top of mind. I think even when we're thinking about brand building, metrics and KPIs are still a big part of it. So how do you kind of go through that process? How do you guide clients or help prioritize the metrics that need to be tracked, right? Because I'm a content strategist first, I love storytelling, but still I know with every content concept or idea, it does need to ladder back to a key goal or objective. And to reach those objectives, you need metrics, right? So can you kind of break down how you think about that, especially given your focus on CPG and on largely these marketplaces or digital shelves, so to speak, and kind of how you parse all of that out? I mean, the answer is we have not found a great solution. Okay. You know, we are looking and there's a lot of companies out there that tout having great content effectiveness measurements But when you look under the hood, it's not exactly what we need. And part of that is because the Amazons and Walmarts of the world hold a lot of their data pretty close in. So it's a little hard to just get that data to understand what we're working with and how play the algorithms and how to make sure content is effective. And that's definitely been a pillar for us and our key clients over the last 12 months is really vetting through the best way to measure this effectiveness. And we've not found a perfect solution yet. Be honest about that. And there's a number of different solutions out there that have elements of solving that question. But I think there's still an opportunity for for somebody to come in that can really answer that question in a reliable and informed way. Yeah, it definitely seems to be, I don't want to say the gap, but definitely the big question for a lot of content teams, a lot of marketing teams, more so because there is such pressure. I mean, I feel like there's always been this bit of tug of war between finance and marketing, but especially now because there are so many platforms and there's this need to be there, right? Be in front of the customer. But now the CFO and the finance team are saying, hey, well, like, what are the results? What are the expectations here? And and kind of challenging. Is that something that you're seeing, again, just given your focus, the types of clients you have? Or do you think this is mainly happening in in pockets and, and it's not as widespread as a lot of the industry analysis and commentary is saying? So I think there 100% is that tension between finance and marketing and content teams. Obviously, you can't just keep spending without showing a return on the investment. But how you measure that is still very much in play. There's definitely a baseline need to show up in the digital world. How and what that specifically looks like for your brand is going to be a function of so many variables, depending on what your brand is, where your consumers are, how they're engaging with you. Different brands get different value out of platforms like TikTok versus an Amazon And as we talked about a little bit earlier, that content effectiveness measurement is still a bit obtuse. And I can understand why CFOs are questioning these things and trying to understand that. But if you look at the broader trends in the industry and the broader figures about who's looking at content and how important it is to any consumer experience, you know, that's kind of your bigger picture starting point of how to justify the spend. And for your particular brand, you're going to do your best to drill down into what's important for your consumer and where they are. Yeah. It's definitely interesting to hear the different recommendations and lessons and things to do for marketing, because it definitely seems like there needs to be 
a bit of a meeting of the minds between finance and marketing, which can be difficult, right? I mean, do you have any tips or in other projects or initiatives, have you found that there have been successful acts of going across the aisle, so to speak? Yeah. I mean, I, mean, I think you just kind of have to be realistic about it, right? Like you wouldn't ask for $2 million for a branding video that's going to have a shelf life of six weeks on Meta if your Facebook audience is under 100,000. There's just like certain things that don't make sense. And I think I've always found that if you approach the conversation with a transparent and reasonable plan that understands the brand goals and objectives and audience, it's not a hard sell. I think maybe some agencies and some sort of historical ways of working have to go by the wayside where it's like, oh, we expect to spend X amount of your marketing budget on content and it's just a matter of math. I don't think that works anymore. I think you just have to really be in tune with your brand, their goals and objectives and what makes sense for them and present them with a smart plan. And, And to be honest, I've never had trouble with that at all with any client because if well, at least with our clients, you know, they know you're looking out for them. You're not just trying to add the mm-hmm. <laughs> the engagement, you know, yeah. increase the scope of <laughs> add work. Add to the tally, right? <laughs> add, add to the tally. You're not just trying to, you know, kill them with add-ons and add-ons, additional scopes. You're just like presenting them with a smart plan and there's enough data, as I said earlier, broadly speaking about why certain things are important. You know, you need to have a strategist like yourself to help put this plan together and what makes sense and how to reach their consumer and be reasonable about how you're doing it. And I've never found an issue, but I'm curious what you're hearing from other people as well. Like what are they finding out there these days? Yeah, I think it does very much vary depending on the brand. And I think talking about the long tail impact of brand in particular, like that's something I've been hearing a lot more like, okay, you're saying performance marketing or metrics driven marketing, but to really drive that demand, like here's the long tail impact of investing in a strong brand story and strong brand marketing. I feel like that's very interesting because I feel like there's always been this misconception or idea that brand marketing is just like this fluffy stuff and it doesn't really do anything. But I feel like with the rise of like purpose driven brands and even science-backed brands, right? Like you're in CPG. And I feel like we've been seeing a lot of those really incredible like cosmetics brands, skincare brands, even pet care brands, right? That are really doubling down on the science behind their product. Like that's brand, right? Like that's the brand story. That's the differentiator. And that helps build trust. So I think that intersection of brand story, brand heritage, and like methods for building trust through content is really important. And that ultimately helps show like the proof is in the pudding, right? Like that ultimately impacts the sales because if there's trust, then there's a likelihood of conversion. So I think that ultimately perks finances ears up a little bit like, oh, okay, if we tell these stories, it does have a tangible impact. But like you said, like the metrics, finding out like what to actually measure and and deliver those numbers in a very rational and detail-oriented way to finance, like the way they need it, I guess is a big part of the equation. And, you know, you did mention this idea of being across platforms, testing different platforms. Do you have any advice for marketing teams that do want to maximize their reach and test new platforms, but also want to be mindful of the spending, right? Like, is it about repurposing? Is it about reusing content? Like what advice or what methods have worked well for your team and for your clients in the past? Can I just respond to something you said in your earlier comment before we get to that question? You were talking about- Yeah, you were talking about how obviously like with the pet space and the beauty space, you know, brand stories are important. Of course, they're absolutely important to marketing initiatives. I think I was considering the devil is in the details on that. Like, sure, we know we need to make some content around your brand story, but what's the spend on that? And what are the channels for that? And that's kind of where the devil is in the details, right? Like we know that brand stories help in a way to sell and build loyalty, but what does that mean in dollars and cents? And that's where it gets a little, a little Oh vague, yeah, absolutely. You know, Agreed. I'm also seeing companies like I was on a panel with Jonathan from Any Road and they do 
they have a great matrix for experiential events and understanding the impact of that for the first time and what the consumer takeaway is and what the ROI is on those sorts of events. So I see in a segmented way, companies coming up, realizing that experiential maybe was X percent of marketing budgets in the past, but really couldn't tie it into a clear ROI other than what you were just talking about, which is like bigger picture brand story and affinity. But now they're actually able to target that a little more specifically, which is really interesting to me. Right. Yeah. And and just to tack on to that point, I know that we've covered and spoken with a few of those like event producers and people who do these activations and they think about like the digital halo effect, so to speak. So like once they have that physical interaction with the brand, how does that lead to digital engagement and ultimately a purchase online? So again, tying back to that omni-channel topic that we brought up earlier making sure that you are creating that call to action for people to continue that conversation or continue that engagement once they have that in-person experience. Exactly. And then I think you were starting to ask me about any particular platforms or things I might recommend. Yeah, and just ways to kind of optimize the investment, right? Because like, I know I personally have been hearing a lot about like repurposing content, taking content from TikTok and rejiggering it, so to speak, for Instagram. Like, yeah, How are you absolutely. guys thinking about that approach? Yeah, it always amazes me. And I see this a lot in very large organizations that there is not a central approach to their content creation, that brand might be doing X, Y, Z, but then shopper is doing ABC and then e-com is doing something completely different. And if you're making the investment in content, it's best to have a holistic approach because what you're shooting for social can go on your PDP page, can go on your website. And there's no reason why you have to silo those assets. You need to repurpose things. We get a lot of mileage. We make a lot of things out of nothing. We'll take packaging elements and create something fun and visual with that. We'll do what we call like a down and dirty shoot and just pick up a couple of assets that we can weave into a a fun video sometimes. We mine libraries of our clients to see what exists that we might be able to pull from. And we have a variety of ways of approaching all that. And that's really, to your point, really, really important because content creation is not just about going out and shooting new things every day. It's about working with what's at hand, being very creative with that, and really showing great value to your clients because back to the content effectiveness model, it's not 100% clear if you pulled something from existing assets and some stock footage and put fun graphics on it, is that going to have more of an impact or less of an impact than going out and shooting something original? It probably depends on the content, but the bigger picture idea here is to use what you can and have that as part of your plan for efficiency's sake. Absolutely. That's great. And then I feel like we've sort of indirectly been talking about this idea of balancing what works and finding ways to test and learn, like you brought up A-B testing earlier. So how can brands best balance that? I mean, there may not be a silver bullet answer or response to that, but I mean, how can brands determine like, okay, like now's the time to really test and figure out what's happening in the market and what our audience responds to versus, okay, we just need like reliability. We need to stick to what works or does there always need to be a balance? I think there always needs to be a balance and it depends on where your brand is in its journey for content, right? Like certain brands need to just get up to speed with what we refer to as your baseline content, whether it's the content needed to have your website robust or content needed to make sure Amazon accepts your product listing. There is a baseline level of content that you can kind of understand and make sure is your first step. And beyond that, you know, I would say the test and learn approach is always a good idea for, I think the test and approach idea is important to do on a regular basis because everything changes so fast. Algorithms change, consumer demand changes, trends change. So none of this is set it and forget it. All of it is fluid and in flux. And you have to really keep vigilant about what your consumers are responding to on a regular basis, whatever that means to your brand, whatever you can afford, whether that's monthly, quarterly, half yearly, 
whatever you can do within your budget and your capacity is important to make that part of your plan. Oh, awesome. I mean, a lot of really great, I think, takeaways and things for our listeners to be thinking about as they continue to plan out their content. I mean, you know, we're going to be running this in the summer, but I mean, prime holiday planning time is right around the corner, right? So any final lessons, takeaways? I know you work with so many different brands, obviously have such expertise creating content, navigating the new content marketing landscape. So taking into account everything we talked about over these past 30 minutes or so, any closing lessons, best practices, takeaways for the folks that are looking for some actionable nuggets to walk away with? Oh, that's a big question. Yeah, I think <laughs> I think to sum it up, like content is here to stay. It's easier to produce, but also harder to measure its effectiveness than ever before. So how your organization adapts to that challenge is going to be really important and considered. And you as a company, big or small, can no longer look at content as something off to the side. Content has to be part of your entire marketing plan with the omni-channel shopper approach, which means using the content on multiple platforms, making sure it's the right visual language and messaging that's consistent with whether you're doing print advertising or broadcast advertising. You want to make sure you've got a cohesive brand identity in all that you do. And then find the ways to test and learn, to keep engaging with your audience as these platforms evolve, as the consumer needs evolve, keep it present. Don't just set it and forget it or your consumers will be moving on to other brands that are reaching them where they are now. Wonderful, Eileen. Well, it's been so fun chatting with you. It was interesting to kind of dig a little bit deeper into some of these topics and trends, finding out where where we're seeing similarities or hearing similarities in the market and and where, you know, there are still areas to explore. So thank you again so much for uh, taking the time out to chat with me today. Oh, thank you so much. I had a great time. I hope this was useful for your listeners. Yeah, absolutely. I know it was useful for me. I already learned a lot. So, um, but we, of course, would love to keep the conversation going on social. We are on Twitter at our touch points, LinkedIn at retail touch points, and Lean will copy you on our posts. That way, if folks have direct questions for you, we can keep the conversation going. And folks listening, if you have any feedback on this episode, we would also love to hear from you. Drop us a line, leave us a rating and review on your preferred podcast player. We are on Spotify, Stitcher, Apple podcast, frankly, anywhere else. We are likely there. And while you're there, be sure to subscribe to the show. We are speaking with folks like Eileen Weekly about the latest trends, best practices, channels, and basically the dynamics that are happening in the retail and marketing landscapes. Very exciting things, very knowledgeable experts. So be sure to subscribe. That way you get new episodes every week delivered to your device. But for now, that's it from us, everyone. Thanks so much for joining us. We'll see you next time. Thanks for listening to this episode of Retail Remix. Be sure to subscribe so you never miss an episode. You can find us on your favorite podcast player. Until next time, keep mixing it up.